Mr. Sprott, we are very pleased to have you with us for this Matterhorn interview. As you know, the gold price started to go up already before the non-tapering announcement of the Fed the other day. Why do you think that happened? That it's like most other things. There's always somebody who knows ahead of time, right? Yeah. And, I, and if you want to take it one step further, Lars, I mean, I, I always thought that the taper talk was to knock the price of gold down. Mm -hmm. Because nothing else got affected, right? Until all of a sudden the bond market backed up in Mr. Bernanke's face. And uh, to think now that, you know, we have no taper and the price of gold's 1360 and it was probably 1700 or 1650 when they announced the taper. So, you know, I, when you look back at all the headlines that we had to sort of go through because of the supposed taper, which I never believed in, by the way, um, I mean, I'm just shocked. Well, I think we'll see quite a dramatic rally here. Yeah. Um, Mr. Sprott, in general, are we witnessing unprecedented times? Of course. Of course we are. I always start with I mean, zero interest rates. I mean, how, how, could any, how could a population believe in that, right? And then you go to printing money. How could a, a group of financial people believe in printing money? Like you so conned the market here into believing that it's some kind of legitimate policy. And then for the, the third thing is for the market to believe we have some kind of economic recovery when all the data points suggest it's impossible that we have a recovery. So those, those three things just drive me nuts in a way. Yeah. Um, taking a look at the gold price, it has been smashed big time during this year and the bull market in gold has lost its steam. Why would you say the best for the gold price is nevertheless yet to come? Well, because, because well, for all sorts of reasons. First of all, the uh, printing money policies are not working. We don't have any economic growth, but we keep increasing the debt. Now, of course, instead of it being at government and an individual level, it's gone to the central bank level. It's still debt, though. Um, I do think Mr. Bernanke lost control of the bond market. That's particularly why he didn't announce tapering this time around. He needs bond interest rates to go down. Um, as you've discussed and many other people have discussed, the physical demand gold is well in excess of the annual supply. I've written three articles all entitled to the Western Central Bank, so any gold left, and I think it's very, very obvious that the central banks have been involved in selling gold out of their vaults to keep the price down uh, so that we can all believe that their fiat currencies are maintain some value even though it's very easy to see that most of the major governments who are carrying out those policies are all insolvent. Yeah. Uh, what things need to be in place before you talk about a bubble in gold? And where do you see the limit for the price of gold? Well, for me to see, uh, let's say, a pop in gold, uh, you would need one of three things. Uh, first of all, you you have a a sort of maniacal move in the price of gold. That might be a dip off. Two, um, you you saw that uh, the central planners actually become more financially responsible, which you, of course we don't see. And three, if they finally capitulated and made the currencies gold backed then, of course, we wouldn't need to be involved in gold because you could be involved with the currency because it would be backed by gold, which I don't suspect we will see either. So I think we have a long way to go uh, before we're, we're going to see any of those elements um, manifest themselves. If one takes a look at the gold price action, the price declines in gold come usually abruptly out of the blue. What does this tell you? tells me that the people who are active on the sell side of the market earnestly want the price down in a hurry before 
some nefarious purpose. Yeah, do you think this is meant as a chuck? It was probably best described by a guy, a fellow named James Turco, I know you know, um, that Fed has had a managed retreat here for the last 13 years in the price of gold. They never wanted the price of gold to go up, but it has gone up. And I think when it was starting to get out of control, when it got up to 1920, that's when they brought in the shock troopers, as you might describe them, right? And just bash things quickly. And of course, we see this more and more all the time. Violent, you know, swings that take a second or a minute or something like that. Uh, well, yeah, I think it's very purposeful. Uh, I think it's meant to discredit gold. Uh, even as we sit here and we think of all the people that would benefit by owning gold, in increasing amounts, when you start including, you know, the Japanese, the Indonesians, the the Indians, the Cypriots, the Greeks. Uh, so many people that would benefit uh, by owning gold instead of owning their own paper currencies. Uh, and that number of people keeps swelling all the time. So um, I, I think that uh, there's a lot, there's, there's more and more reasons to own gold all the time. But the biggest reason, the one I focused on the most, is the physical demand elements. And I, I liken what's happening here to, I just see exactly what's happening. They ran out of gold. They nailed the paper markets and sucked 700 tons out of the uh, trusts and ETFs and things like that. They they convinced India to literally abort gold ships into the country and with very draconian moves, including uh, yesterday's move of increasing the, uh, the tax from 10 to 15%. And then I find it hilarious, by the way, that gold has been so good in India over the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the country that benefited most by the gold going up. But it's obvious that central planners are out of gold, and they go to the only big buyer they can go to because they can't go to China and say, you've got to stop your people from buying gold. And, and I, I, it's amazing that, I mean, there's not a week goes by that there's not a new measure in India. And again, yeah, again, they didn't disappoint us this week. So you can see that the pressure's on to, uh, to keep the Indians out of the market. So I think the physical argument is overwhelming. I was just in China and uh, I get, you know, we only get one data point from China. That's what goes from Hong Kong into China. We don't know what goes into China from Geneva or, or London or New York or, you know, whether it goes to Shanghai or Beijing. We don't get that data point. We can rest assured there's more than just Hong Kong. And um, Hong, Hong Kong shipments represent about over, over 55% of what's produced in a month. Well, could be that China is consuming something like 75% of all the gold produced. Imagine if we actually let the Indians buy what they wanted to buy. We would have consumption of probably 150% of monthly production if the Indians could buy what they would have preferred to buy at these levels. Mm -hmm. That's just two countries, let alone all the other buyers. Of gold. Yeah. Uh, what are the main dynamics uh, that are driving the gold price, absent these price shocks that we were talking about? Do you think those dynamics are well understood in the public and mainstream financial journalism? Well, nothing's well understood in the mainstream media. Our latest example is Taper. Yeah, because they bought big time into this. Everybody bought into it. You know, the main, mainstream media is a meaningless uh, media for, the, for anybody who wants to be a thinker about what's going on in the financial business because it's always been make people think a certain way and um, cover over things that aren't working and divert your attention to this, that, and the other. And of course, I mean, I've been involved in this for 13 years. I can't believe, I can't tell you the number of times that, you know, gold is debauched in the, uh, in the mainstream media. Uh, that's just something you get used to. Um, but thank God mainstream media doesn't mean much to a certain segment of the population and certainly a lot of the Asian population and, and those who are free thinkers in the uh, in the developed world. So we, we will win the day. I think we've won the day already. It's just that uh, we have an enemy who doesn't want to give up yet. Yeah. But uh, they will be forced to give up. 
Um, mainstream financial journalism labels you uh, a conspiracy theorist for talking about the gold price and gold market manipulation. I won't talk with you about this. My question is rather, as an active market participant, uh, becomes the manipulation more obvious, more and more? Sure, of course it is. Hell, oh, not only that, people who admit to it more and more. I mean, to think that, you know, we had the LIBOR thing, then we had the electricity thing, and uh, I think J.P. Morgan just agreed to pay some $980 million fine here for manipulating the high-grade investment yield market. The Fed manipulates the interest market, we know that. I mean, if it's not manipulation, I don't know what you call it. Just because it's done by government doesn't mean it's not manipulation. It is manipulation. Making a market go somewhere where it doesn't belong. Um, so, and I have no doubt when I look at the physical statistics for gold, I know the market is manipulated. And you can call me a conspiracy theorist if you want. I mean, it's almost becoming normal to have conspiracies. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling it like it is. And I think most most people who spend some time thinking about it, which is not the mainstream media, would realize that there's all sorts of incentives for people to manipulate things, particularly when there's no a jurisprudence uh, that comes out of it all. Yeah. And um, how do you see this, um, uh, that this manipulation becomes more obvious? What is this a sign for? Well, sure, there's lots of reasons to show that the manipulation is, is obvious, particularly in gold. So we see the COMEX inventories go down. Uh, we see that Germany can't get their gold for seven years. I mean, literally four, I think we've written on this before. I mean, they asked for 4% of their gold, that the U.S. had is 4% of their gold, and they, it takes over seven years, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's 50 tons a year, and, and meanwhile, China imports 100 tons a month yeah. through, through Hong Kong. So there's not a logistical issue here. It's not that tough to deliver it. Um, we've seen the lease rates on gold indicate there's a tightness. We've seen a activation in gold from time to time which indicates the tightness. Um, just the sheer analysis of the physical numbers tells you that the central banks have to be selling here in a non-transparent way. So, and, they, and they've been doing it for a long time. So sooner or later, they're going to look in, in their, their vaults and say, you know, we've lost this game. Are we going to stop this and just let the price go? Or... You know, there's going to be a level where they're going to know it's, it's they're, at, they're at a point of no return, and ISIS is not very far from there. You know, it's been a long, hard battle. The recent data of shipments into China and India till they stopped the, uh, the the flow. I mean, they were so unbelievably large that uh, you knew the central banks had a seller here. And I think the orchestrated takedown in order to drain the trust. I mean, 700 tons in, in half a year is 1,400 tons a year. That's about two-thirds of uh, mine supply, ex-Russia and ex-China. So that was a huge increase artificially and temporarily in the gold supply, the fact that they scared everyone out of the, uh, the trusts and the ETFs. Will the West uh, regret its anti-gold policy, po policy someday soon? The West will regret all their financial policies someday soon. Yeah. And uh, will they end up in a catastrophe? I don't see any way out of it. I mean, we nearly had past, you know, wait, we were in hours of, of uh, doing what should have happened at the time because of the leverage in the bank system. And now we just levered it up more by the central bank stake on the obligations. Um, it, it it will end up in a lot of uh, defaults and non-payment of commitments. There's just no way around it. That's the easiest call of all time, that these governments cannot honor their promises, yeah. financial promises. So this will end up with a huge credibility crisis, right? Well, I would say there already is a credibility yeah. crisis. Yeah. I mean, what do we think the Fed's credibility is today? In 09, we're talking about an exit policy. That's another one that was, you know, supposed to keep things under control and suggest that they were, were uh, prudent. And I think paper talk was meant to suggest they were prudent, and they got away with it for six months. Well, here we are, and now we know they're not prudent again. 
and we may get a very dovish new chairman of the Fed, it would appear that way. So the market knows that, that we don't have a prudent uh, individuals running uh, the, um, the monetary policies in the world. They're not prudent whatsoever, including, of course, the most extreme example recently is what happened in Japan, which was beyond anything the Fed's done on a relative basis. Yeah. Is this kamikaze um, um, policy in Japan? Well, I think it's, you know, if you realize, it, it, I, I imagine that central planners are talking all the time, okay? Mm -hmm. And somebody has to be buying somebody else's bonds all the time because there are these ebbs and flows. And, of course, in the last month, for example, the Japanese, I think, they bought something like 55 billion of bonds, U.S. bonds while rates were going up because they probably got the call. We need somebody to buy these bonds. And uh, I'm sure the opposite would be true uh, if, you know, Japanese rates went up and then they might lean on the Fed or the Bank of England or if Europe's banks needed money. As you know, there's some thought the Fed has lent a lot of money to the European commercial banking system. Yes. He doesn't have quite the same authority. So there's all this quid pro quo going on Uh, but collectively, it's just massively irresponsible. What do you expect would be the outcome if there was an independent audit of the gold of the U.S. Treasury? Um, I don't think there will probably ever be an audit. Yeah. Somebody announces it's all gone and, and then said, let's do an audit. <laughs> Wouldn't take long. Um, I don't think there'll be an audit, but I suspect that there's not nearly the amount of gold there that they suggest. And this is the reason that there will be no audit? Of course. We can't have an audit say the gold's not there. So there won't be an audit for sure. But it's worthwhile to call for it, or do you think otherwise? Well, it's worthwhile to call for it. I mean, Ron Paul tried to get it approved, but of course it got uh, uh, nixed somewhere along the line. It's not going to happen. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. I, I'm sure the gold's not there. Yeah. Are you for physical silver more optimistic than the for physical gold in the go long run? Well, I certainly think as much as gold was the investment of last decade and will be a great investment this decade, I think silver will outperform gold in this decade uh, simply because there's so little supply of silver. I always find it fascinating that uh, in the U.S. At the US Mint, People spend as much money buying silver as gold. That in itself is phenomenal. Why Why they would do that, I don't know, but they do. Which means they're buying 50 times more silver than gold every year. Well, it's only produced at 11 to 1, and it's only available for investment 3 to 1. So I don't know how long people can keep buying it at 50 to 1 and have the price stay at these levels. So all, I've always thought the price was massively undervalued here. And even though I'm incredibly optimistic gold or the short and medium, intermediate and long term, I'm, I'm more excited about silver for the next uh, remaining part of this decade. Yeah, for those people who do not really understand silver and what it does um, in the markets, uh, can you tell us a little bit about this, the fundamentals? Well, sure. Uh, to me, the most, well, I have not spent a lot of time on the industrial side, and the reason, Lars, I have not done that is because I see the investment side just dominating what's going to happen to the silver price. I mean, I can, you know, discuss things like you know, the increased demand for silver and uh, solar energy and medical purposes and conductivity and all those things that I read about all the time, all of which are incredibly positive. To me, the biggest thing is if people start fearing money and fearing banks, there's such a small amount of metal purchased in the world that any 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 major group deciding to buy silver and there will be no silver. I mean it would only take twenty billion dollars to to get rid of all the silver that supposedly is lying around there, which I doubt is lying around anyway. So um, that's why I see silver doing better. And I, I don't really concern myself about the industrial uses because of course just a few investors moving in, such as seems to be happening in, in India, as they put these restrictions on gold, of course, now they're buying more silver. Well, 
I mean, God forbid that the Indians are forced to buy as many dollars of silver as they would like to buy dollars of gold that they can't buy. I think I calculated what they would buy in the half a year, they'd buy two years of silver supply, 100% of all of the silver supply. So it's um, it will take very little to get silver really going. Yeah. Do you have a specific uh, price target for silver in dollar terms? Well, I certainly think within the next year, it'll be north of $50. And I certainly think gold within the next year will be you know, well north of 2000 So, and I, by the way, I think the gains we made in the, uh, the precious metal stocks just stunned me because it's so beat up here. And uh, normally, as you might be aware, the stocks do two or three times better than any appreciation in the price of gold or, or or a silver for that matter. And I suspect this time having been so beat up, I'm sure at a minimum they'll at least triple the performance. Well, you know, silver went back from, let's, let's say, was it 20 to 50, that 150% move, and triple that in the stock price. You're talking about a 450% gain in the year here. So yeah, I think it's going to be a very exciting time this next year in the, uh, in the equities. Yeah. And what's your outlook for platinum and palladium? Well, I don't specifically cover platinum and palladium at our at our firm. I would suggest you speak to uh, David Franklin or Rick Rule on that, because I don't spend every uh, waking moment looking at the fundamentals as I might yeah. do gold and silver. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would refuse to have you uh, speak to them. Yeah, but the, uh, just a little uh, bit. Uh, I mean, you talk to them uh, sometimes. But this way, Lars, I'm sure that if gold and silver hit new highs, it You know, platinum and plating will follow right along. So I just I'm not 100 intimate with the the uh, the physical fundamentals and you know what the new uses are and you know, you know what's happening in South Africa minute to minute things like that. Yeah, it's, it's not my not an area I focused on. Okay, But I'm absolutely convinced they'll, they'll be a lot higher. Yeah, and what's your outlook for energy commodities? I mean, there's the gold and oil ratio, and it's pretty much stable. Do you think uh, that oil will follow gold? I, I, well, I'm, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on oil. Um, but I can tell you this. When I, whenever people say, well, why are you not investing in oil? I say, well, I'm not investing in oil because I'd much rather invest in the real reserve currency. And when I can see such spectacular gains, I just rule everything else out of my mind. I feel so certain of it. I spend so much time looking at it. I don't need to guess at where the price of oil is going. Um, and I've done so much work on um, gold and silver, and I can see exactly what should happen. And, and of course, it has not happened in these last two years as I expected it to. But then again, everything that's happened and why it's happened all seems so so obvious every time you get to look back 2020 hindsight exactly what was going on so those are those are unusual anomalous factors coming into the market that in the long run of course won't carry the day in the long run supply and demand will carry the day so but so i don't be i mean i i prefer to own something real and something paper and oil would be in that category uh, but i don't have a specific on oil here. Yeah, but do you think that gold could become a prime form of money in international trade, for example, in exchange for energy and natural resources? Um, places like the Middle East or Russia could be open for this, right? Well, I have no doubt that lots of people would prefer to receive gold, whether people are prepared to pay gold is a whole other thing. Um, because, of course, the international trade is so much bigger than the The, the trading of the gold market, say, I think there might be some difficulty with that, particularly with the amount of currency outstanding, is I don't even know what the multiple is. It is a number, amount of uh, gold that's out there, but it's, uh, you know, yeah. probably 10, 20, or 30 times bigger. So they're going to have to some, be some adjustment to actually be able to use gold as uh, to back your currency. And of course, that adjustment has to take place with the price of gold going up. So I think ultimately we're going to come to that. Uh, I don't know if it'd be know, day-to-day -day things, but I think, you know, on a balance of payments basis, uh, I suspect that uh, some governments are going to want to get paid in, in hard currency rather than fiat currency. Yeah. Do you think that the Chinese will ultimately back up the yuan in, with gold? 
I think the intention there is to get a significant amount of gold in the country so that they then can suggest that their currency is the strongest currency. Even in their case, I don't think they can get enough gold to back all the currency in circulation. Mm -hmm. What's your outlook in general for the future, not just financially, but maybe also seen from a geopolitical and social political point of view? Well, unfortunately, um, if we have some uh, uh, real financial carnage here, we already have an economy where the lower income groups are being dispossessed daily. I mean, God forbid that we have some kind of uh, situation in the financial industry where they are more looted. And when I say looted, I can point to Cyprus, I can now point to Poland and their bonds. Uh, you can point to currency controls, and whether it's uh, uh, Argentina or Venezuela, but we get more and more of these populations who, who are negatively affected by the decisions being made in order to keep people who are in power in power and make things seemingly look like they're normal. So I, I'm not very constructive on where this all might go. I think we need to totally reshape the financial system. The whole leverage bank system is, to, to the degree that it's leveraged, is totally ridiculous. Yeah. But do you think that uh, a big war might be the exit strategy, the real exit strategy? Lars, I don't have an opinion on that. Mm. I really don't know. I, uh, it's not something I, I well, I know a lot of people think that that, that could happen. It might happen if people get desperate, you know, that uh, maybe war might seem like a, a better choice than just, you know, being poor and dying. <laughs> But I, I don't have it, you know. Okay. I thank you very much for taking your time. Okay, Lars. All the best. Hey, yo, yo, to you too. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. the central planners actually become more financially responsible, which you, of course we don't see. And three, if they finally capitulated and made the currencies gold back, then of course we wouldn't need to be involved in gold because you could be involved with the currency because it would be backed by gold, which I don't suspect we will see either. So I think we have a long way to go uh, before we're, we're going to see any of those elements um, manifest themselves. If one takes a look at the gold price action, the price declines in gold come usually abruptly, out of the blue. What does this tell you? <laughs> That's a great question. It tells me that people who are active on the sell side of the market earnestly want the price down in a hurry for some nefarious purpose. Yeah, do you think this is meant as a chuck? It was probably best described by a guy, a fellow named James Turk, I know you know, um, that Fed has had a managed retreat here for the last 13 years in the price of gold. They never wanted the price of gold to go up, but it has gone up. And I think And it was starting to get out of control when it got up to 1920. That's when they brought in the shock troopers, as you might describe them, right? And just bashed things quickly. And of course, we see this more and more all the time. Violent, you know, swings that take a second or a minute or something like that. Uh, well, yeah, I think it's very purposeful. Uh, I think it's meant to discredit gold. Uh, even as we sit here and we think of all the people that would benefit by owning gold, in increasing amounts when you start including, you know, the Japanese, the Indonesians, the, the Indians, the Cypriots, the Greeks, uh, so many people that would benefit uh, by owning gold instead of owning their own paper currencies. Uh, and that number of people keeps swelling all the time when all the data points suggest it's impossible that we have a recovery. So those three things just drive me nuts in a way. Yeah. 
um, taking a look at the gold price, it has been smashed big time during this year and the bull market in gold has lost its steam. Why would you say the best for the gold price is nevertheless yet to come? Well, <laughs> because well, for all sorts of reasons. First of all, the uh, printing money policies are not working. We don't have any economic growth, but we keep increasing the debt. Now, of course, instead of it being at government and individual level, it's gone to the central bank level. It's still debt, though. Um, I do think Mr. Bernanke lost control of the bond market. That's particularly why he didn't announce tapering this time around. He needs bond interest rates to go down. Um, as you've discussed and many other people have discussed, the physical demand gold is well in excess of the annual supply. I've written three articles all entitled to the Western Central Bank have any gold left and I think it's very very obvious that the central banks have been involved in selling gold out of their vaults to keep the price down uh, so that we can all believe that their fiat currencies are maintain some value even though it's very easy to see that most of the major governments who are carrying out those policies are all insolvent. Yeah. Uh, what things need to be in place before you talk about a bubble in gold? And where do you see the limit for the price of gold? Well, for me to see, uh, let's say, a pop in gold, uh, you would need one of three things. Uh, first of all, you you have a a sort of maniacal move in the price of gold that might be a dip off. Two, um, you you saw that uh, uh, that are driving the gold price absent these price shocks that we were talking about. Do you think those dynamics are well understood in the public and mainstream financial journalism? Well, nothing's well understood in the mainstream media. Our latest example was Tabor. Yeah, because they bought big time into this. Everybody bought into it. You know, the main, mainstream media is a meaningless uh, media for the for anybody who wants to be a thinker about what's going on in the financial business, because it's always been make people think a certain way and um, cover over things that aren't working and divert your attention to this, that, and the other. And of course. I mean, I've been involved in this for 13 years. I can't believe, I can't tell you the number of times that, you know, gold is debauched in the, uh, in the mainstream media. Uh, that's just something you get used to. Um, but thank God mainstream media doesn't mean much to a certain segment of the population and certainly a lot of the Asian population and, and those who are free thinkers in the, uh, in the developed world. So... We will win the day. I think we've won the day already. It's just that we have an enemy who doesn't want to give up yet. Yeah. But uh, they will be forced to give up. Um, mainstream financial journalism labels you uh, a conspiracy theorist for talking about the gold price and gold market manipulation. I won't talk with you about this. My question is rather, as an active market participant, uh, becomes the manipulation more obvious? More and more. Sure, of course it is. Hell, not only that, people who admit to it more and more. I mean, to think that, you know, we had the LIBOR thing, then we had the electricity thing, and uh, I think J.P. Morgan just agreed to pay some $980 million fine here for manipulating the high-grade investment yield market. The Fed manipulates the interest market. We know that. I mean, if it's not manipulation, I don't know what you call it. Just because it's done by government doesn't mean it's not manipulation. It is manipulation. Making a market go somewhere where it doesn't belong. Um, so, and I have no doubt.
Mr. Sprott, we are very pleased to have you with us for this Matterhorn interview. As you know, the gold price started to go up already before the non-tapering announcement of the Fed the other day. Why do you think that happened? And it's like most other things. There's always somebody who knows ahead of time, right? Yeah. And, I, and if you want to take it one step further, Lars, I mean, I, I always thought that the taper talk was to knock the price of gold down. Mm-hmm. Because nothing else got affected, right? Until all of a sudden the bond market backed up in Mr. Bernanke's face. And uh, to think now that, you know, we have no taper and the price of gold's 1360 and it was probably 1700 or 1650 when they announced the taper. So, you know, I'd, when, you, when you look back at all the headlines that we had to sort of go through because of the supposed taper, which I never believed in, by the way, um, I mean, I'm just shocked. Well, I think we'll see quite a dramatic rally here. Yeah. Um, Mr. Sprott, in general, are we witnessing unprecedented times? Of course. Of course we are. I always start with, I mean, zero interest rates. I mean, how, how, could, any, how could a population believe in that, right? And then you go to printing money. How could a, a, a group of financial people believe in printing money? Like so conned market here into believing that it's some kind of legitimate policy, and then for them, the third thing is for the market to believe we have some kind of economic recovery. So um, I, I think that uh, there's a lot. There's, there's more and more reasons to go low. But the biggest reason, the one I focus on the most, is the physical demand elements, and I. I Liken what's happening here to, I just see exactly what's happening. They ran out of gold. They nailed the paper markets and sucked 700 tons out of the uh, trusts and ETFs and things like that. They, they convinced India to literally abort gold ships into the country and with very draconian moves, including uh, yesterday's move of increasing the, uh, the tax from 10 to 15%. And then I find it hilarious, by the way, that gold has been so good to India over the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a country that benefited most by the price of gold going up. But it's obvious that central planners are out of gold, and they go to the only big buyer they can go to because they can't go to China and say, you've got to stop your people from buying gold. And, and I, I, it's amazing that, I mean, there's not a week goes by that there's not a new measure in India. And again, yet again, they didn't disappoint us this week. So you can see that the pressure's on to uh, to keep the Indians out of the market. So I think the physical argument is overwhelming. I was just in China, and uh, I get, you know, we only get one data point from China. That's what goes from Hong Kong into China. We don't know what goes into China from Geneva or or London or New York or, you know, whether it goes to Shanghai or Beijing. We don't get that data point. You can rest assured there's more than just Hong Kong. And um, Hong, Hong Kong shipments represent about you know, over half, over 55% of what's produced in a month. So it could be that China is consuming something like 75% of all the gold produced. Imagine if we actually let the Indians buy what they wanted to buy. We would have consumption of probably 150% of monthly production if the Indians could buy what they would have preferred to buy at these levels. Mm -hmm. That's just two countries, let alone all the other players. Yeah. Uh, what are the main dynamics?